So, good afternoon. My name is uh, Marcus Hurt. I'm working for Oracle in the Java product group. And um, this talk is going to be how you can go <laughs> build your own autonomous robotic vehicle. So hopefully, after I'm done talking, you'll all be able to just you know, go shop some stuff uh, <laughs> off the internet and, and, and go. go build your own vehicle. So um, since I'm working for Oracle, I need to have this disclaimer slide, which basically says that anything that I'm saying about future direction of Oracle products, et cetera, um, should not be used for purchasing uh, decisions. So yeah, now that that is done. The main goal of this presentation is to share the fun, because it's actually quite hilarious to have your Java applications interact with physical reality, especially if they are buggy. You know, it's, it's quite a lot of fun, and it's really not hard these days. It's not even that expensive. So, you know, as far as hobbies goes, I'd say, uh, you know, average. <laughs> so, uh, and again, not that hard. I'm also going to show you how you can put JFR to good use when you're building these robots because um, it can be quite hard. You know, there, it's hard to do feature extraction. It's hard to do, uh, you know, corner detection. All these things are hard to get perfectly right. And if you do have something where you can record your sensor data and then apply your alg algorithms and develop your, your uh, algorithms and visualize them, then it's much much easier. So. Two disclaimers. First one, I'm not a roboticist. That is not my area uh, of expertise. And the second one is that I will be mentioning specific companies. Those are not endorsed by Oracle in any way. Uh, you know, I'm not getting any, anything from them. I'm buying like everybody else. It's just that there is a large amount of components out there. And these, I know, worked. They worked for me, so they probably work for you as well. So I want to get pragmatic, right? These things uh, work. So this is Coffee. <clears throat> I named him Coffee because he's running Java. And uh, his laser rangefinder well, makes him look a bit like Wally, so I didn't really have an <laughs> any choice. Of course, he had to be named um, Coffee. And here is Coffee running at home, an early version with no quadrature encoders, um, running in autonomous mode. And some volume. OK, you won't hear it then. But so um, my son, uh, which you can see probably no, maybe not, running away, he's screaming loudly here. So he's, he's uh, terrified of that robot. <laughs> so the, the idea was for me to have something to do with the kids, you know, some, some nice project to do together. And he's scared shitless. <laughs> so that didn't really work out. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, yeah, and I didn't bring coffee today because, um, you know, I did bring him to Java 1, and that was a total pain. Um, he got stuck in customs uh, on the way to Java 1, and he got stuck in customs in Germany when he was going back to Switzerland, where I live. Um, so, you know, maybe participating in Oktoberfest, I don't know, but it was just a pain. And this was what Swiss told me when I asked if I could bring the robot on the plane. So they said, kindly note that it looks like a tank, and therefore the authorities at the airport, you know, TSA, TSA uh, might reach a different decision. And Swiss as an airline cannot guarantee anything on our end. So uh, I don't think things have improved <laughs> since early this year. <laughs> so I just didn't want a, want a chance uh, bringing the robot. I did bring some parts of him, though, so uh, that I can show. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. What to think about when you're building hardware that you're going to run on a non-real-time operating system and perhaps on a Java virtual machine. Then I will briefly mention some things that I've learned as a 3D printing noob <laughs> that, that, that uh, I'd like to share. And um, I will talk about how you can record the sensor information in the flight recorder in the JVM and do some demos. Of course, I don't have the robot, but I did some recordings at Java 1 when he was running around in autonomous mode. So we'll show that and then talk a bit about the results and some future stuff that I'm up to. <clears throat> so the brain then. Uh, it can't have escaped uh, you that there's been a bit of a revolution uh, in terms of small computing devices. So we have the Raspberry Pi. I don't know how much it costs in the US, but it's probably around $30. Uh, and, and uh, Raspberry Zero, I think, is $5 or something ridiculous. So 
when there was preview quite a heavy cost uh, when you started hooking up hardware to your computer, uh, that is no longer so. And I have released the blue smoke in one device. <laughs> so I have killed one Raspberry Pi um, in the early days. So that may happen, but it's not going to put you down uh, back too, too much. And in terms of embedded devices, these computers have quite the computing power and, and, and uh, uh, the RAM. So one gigabyte, four cores ARM, uh, you can do some interesting stuff with that. So um, that is what I'm using in coffee. I'm us using Raspberry Pi 2. Uh, I have a Raspberry Pi 3 for my next project, which I will be mention bri mentioning uh, briefly. I'm running Linux, Raspbian. There are several different uh, distributions. And you have plenty of ports, um, so there is a lot of hardware you can hook up to these things. Then selecting a software stack, <coughs> I went with Java. Uh, so I visited um, a big university in, in, in Switzerland, and they were actually using Intel uh, NUX uh, for, for, their, for their drones and running Windows. <laughs> so you know, I didn't want to <laughs> put myself in a corner here, so I thought, you know, why, why not use Java? Also, the tooling support is excellent. I have been remotely debugging my robot while it has been running and executed code in that Java process. Um, so, so, you know, the tooling process for Java is, is very, very, very good. And also, it's the devil I know. For those of you who know my background, um, it, you know, I, I, I've been doing Java stuff for a while. And also, the language support, that wasn't an issue for me. I went with pure Java, but there are a lot of different languages running on the Java runtime these days. So, you know, Clojure, uh, JRuby, whatever. Then you need to select the Java runtime. So there are several ones on ARM. Uh, you have the Java ME embedded, which is optimized for small devices. Uh, so, you know, you can run it on 128K. That is considered small these days. That's 128 more times more than I had in my first computer, but still, you know, times change. So, uh, but, 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 you know, fairly small devices uh, these days. And uh, you, you have a very pleasant library for accessing the hardware. Uh, I'd argue that it's better designed than what you would do get if, you, if, you're, if you're using Java S embedded. Then again, Java S embedded has tired comp tiered compilation, generational GC, multi-core support, richer library, you know, you have NIO and, and concurrency, and uh, flight recorder support. So I went with Java SE embedded, and the drawback then is that you need an external library to access the hardware, um, something called Pi4j, which is uh, built upon a native library called Wiring Pi. So, uh, the API is very C-like, but who cares? I mean, it's, uh, it's just for reading and writing addresses mostly anyways. Um, okay, then you want a sensor. Uh, of course, you want to have sensors and actuators in your robot. And I'll do a quick detour because um, it will become evident later why. So this is a pulse with modulation signal. Um, it's a very common way to control servos, for instance. Uh, for normal hobby servos, it's a 50 hertz signal. So you have each period being 20 milliseconds. And to tell the servo to be centered, you keep the pulse up for 1.5 milliseconds, right? That's centered. 1.0 seconds is, you know, full travel of the servo in one direction, and two is full travel in the other direction. So why am I talking about this? Well, if you have a one millisecond garbage collection happening, just, you know, when you're about to pull the signal down, you go from, say, hard right left to, to actually getting hard right. You know, the opposite of what you wanted, just for one millisecond GC. So that's why I'm bringing this up. And you might get into a very undefined space if you have, say, uh, you know, a six millisecond garbage collection. Um, it's going to be undefined. So when you're selecting sensors, uh, I recommend avoiding sensors that require timing-sensitive decoding in Java. And if that isn't possible, you can always try, and this is not, uh, you know, trivial. You can write your own, own C library, um, have it as a kernel module, maybe. Um, on my br blog, I actually have an example of that, where, where um, there is a, <laughs> this uh, Korean producer of, of a certain humidity sensor, so, you know. That is certainly possible. 
it's a very speci specialized uh, one-way protocol for, for just that device. And, and um, so, so that can be done. And um, if that isn't possible, you can get your own little uh, microcontroller. Uh, so have a PIC or an Arduino Nano and dedicate that thing to just decoding or encoding whatever protocol you want to support. And I'm having that for, for, for my next project, for a very specific thing that I couldn't find a chip that actually does what I want to do. <coughs> OK. So Kofi has these sensors. He has a laser. Um, it's called LiDAR Light V2. And it works you know, up to 40 meters, I'd say. And the great thing with this is that previously, you had to spend thousands of dollars for a laser rangefinder. This one costs, uh, well, it did cost 89 bucks. Then Garmin <laughs> acquired Pulse, <laughs> Pulse Light, um, what's in the, the name of the company. And then they, now they cost, I think, 150 or something. <laughs> but uh, it's still, for a laser rangefinder, quite agreeable price. So I can highly recommend that. Then I have an IMU, so an uh, inertia measurement uh, unit. So you have gyros, accelerometers, uh, magnetometers, uh, and the barometer. And this is all on one little breakout board from Adafruit called the uh, Adafruit 10 degree to, uh, Degrees of Freedom breakout. And in coffee, I'm not using most of those. Uh, I bought it because of my next project. So I wanted to have a hardware platform that I can use for other things as well. And then I have a GPS. So the GPS is for knowing where I am when he's running outside. And the camera. The camera is currently just streaming things. I'm relying on the, mostly on the laser. Uh, so the question was, what am I using the barometer for? Well, you can use it for, for, to implement a simple varimeter. But that's not what I'm using it for in coffee. I'm not using it in, in, in coffee. So as I said, most of the IMU I'm not using. I'm using um, the gyro for being able to precisely know how much I turn. So that's most, and I also have the accelerometer for uh, when I was developing. It was very handy to be able to let the, um, stop the autonomous mode when, and just stop when I lift him fast upwards. <laughs> so, you know, lift him up, <laughs> stop. <laughs> um, so, but I'm mostly using the gyro. Uh, I will get back to the other project later. Okay, so then, of course, um, oh, switch right so actuators um, you probably want to control servos for all kinds of things um, you might have a I don't know you have a grip claw you have a, uh, you as I did I put the laser range finder on two servos so that I can pan the laser and tilt the laser so uh, and again when you're doing servos you probably want to have something that generates the signal and has its own timer. So there is a chip called uh, PCA9685 that has a built-in timer. And you basically configure the waveform you want it to output. And it will keep outputting that waveform until you change it. So if, until you reconfigure it to output something else. So you know, the GC problem goes away. <laughs> and for motors, yeah, spend some time calculating what you want the max speed to be of your, your thing. Uh, and your torque requirements. Uh, and also one thing to consider when you select motors if, is if you want quadrature encoders. You might be using steppers as well, but um, I'm using ordinary brushed uh, DC motors. And there, is, there are these nice little holes, hole effect um, sensors that allow you to, to decide how much uh, the wheel has traveled or the axis has turned, right? So it's very useful. For controlling the motors, uh, I first started out with H-Bridge, uh, uh, simple H-Bridge motor controllers. Then I switched to more advanced motor controller that actually had built-in quadrature decoders. So, uh, you know, has its own uh, proportional integral, integral uh, derivative uh, logic built in. It's cheating, but that's not where I wanted to spend most of my time. <laughs> okay, actuators. So, um, these are the actuators I'm using. Uh, I have 25 millimeter metal gear motors from Polulu uh, with quadrature encoders. 
So when you select your motors, you, you need to think a little bit about what, what, what your requirements are in terms of torque and what battery packs you're using. So I wanted to be able to use the same battery packs I'm using for flying my, my planes. You know? uh, so, so I selected a 12 volt one. There are also six volt ones. Um, and if you want to use, so one thing that I might mention is if you're using 7.4 uh, volt lithium polymer packs, you might want to go with the low powered engines because they don't take as much of a beating when you over voltage them. So, yeah, and then I have some motor controllers. I actually kept one H bridge for controlling the claw, and then I'm using uh, the Robo Claw controller for, for controlling the engines, the main engines. Then I have two servos, as I said, and uh, a little breakout board for. for uh, emitting PWM signals. Right. Then wiring it up. This is something I wish I knew uh, years ago when I was building my planes. Uh, so uh, I always used to buy these little servo cables and various different adapters and you know, spent a lot of money on that. Then I discovered a few years ago that the connectors are actually called DuPont connectors and they are available in whatever polarity you want. So just buy a crimp tool and then go to eBay and you can buy them in the hundreds for a few bucks <laughs> and build your own cables in the exact length you want them. So um, that's what I did. And I wanted to use my, the same battery packs as in my plane. So I used XT60. And you can totally nerd out in terms of connectors. I'm using all of those in, in, for various reasons in, in coffee. But y you, know, you get really far just using these DuPont connectors and a raster. And if you're borderline OCD, you can get these sorting boxes and your life will be much happier. Yeah. So prototyping with MakeBlock. So MakeBlock was this crowdfunded pro project um, for a system, Meccano-like system for, for, I don't know if it was explicitly for robotics, but it works really well for it. So you have these wonderful uh, aluminum profiles that you can put together in various different ways. And, uh, and they are pretty much compatible with the Polulu 25 millimeter engines, just that the axis is shorter for, for, from the Polulu engines. So you need to do an axis transplant, uh, transplant for, for, for using the Polulu engines. But other than that, uh, you know, they work just fine. So I said it was a disaster with my kids having, having that robot. They were really scared because they couldn't control it. So I built radio controlled versions and they were much happier with that. So that's my daughter trying out a uh, radio controlled version is dead, and here's my son driving another version. And I'm using quadrature encoders. You can see that they go really straight, right? Zoom. And then, of course, you let them play together. And, and uh, you know, the expected thing happens, and everybody screams, and it's all mayhem. Um, right. So uh, designing stuff for 3D printing. So. Um, I haven't owned my 3D printer for a very long time, but uh, using a parametric 3D modeler is a wonderful, wonderful thing because um, you're going to have some measurements that you're going to want to be able to change. So for example, the server width height, uh, the, the model height, maybe, maybe the battery pack inserts, all these things, if you use a parametric model, you can very easily change if you get the constraints right. And you should try out the constraints while you are modeling so that you have the constraints right because going back and fixing them afterwards is a pain. Um, and uh, Autodesk Fusion uh, is actually free for hobbyists. So you know it's a pretty expensive software package that you can just go ahead and use. Also, designing around uh, current limits. So uh, current consumer 3D technology 3D printer uh, technology works uh, in a way. They, they, it's called fused um, filament fabrication or, or fused deposit modeling. So it actually just uh, extrudes plastic layer by layer. It takes a really long time to build things. And of course, you need to have something to extrude on. If you're building a 3D house and you have a lamp, a chandelier hanging from, from the middle of the model and you want to print that all in one go, of course, when it comes to the layer for printing the, the lamp, there is nothing underneath, so it will just extrude plastic onto the floor of the, the house. So you need something underneath. Um, and you actually need to have the maximum overhang that you can get is about 45 degrees. Um, this is not going to show well, but uh, so 
you can look at this later to see see what it actually looks like when you have m more overhang than, than, than it can handle. There are some techniques to get around that. There is a material called uh, polyvinyl alcohol that is wa water soluble, so you can just print your, your supports in that material, and then you put the entire model into water, everything, you know, the support material dissolves, and, and you're good to go. And I'm not doing that anymore. I have it, I actually have a, a, a dual extruder printer, but no, ev not everybody has. So if you start designing things for that scenario, not everybody can print your, your designs. So stop doing that. Also, I found it very useful to just mock up things that I need to be able to fit into the model. So on the left is a mock up that I used for, for my, my special um, circuit board. And on the right is the, the make block design that it needed to go into. And this is what it looks like uh, in, in the modeler. So, <clears throat> so yeah, 3D printing takes quite a long time. The canopy thing in the upper left takes about a day, I mean 24 hours, over 20 hours to print. So it really does take a long time. And that's why you do want to mock up things and make sure that everything fits together before you start because it's not so much the plastic waste. Um, and the plastic that I'm using is biodegradable. So, you know, it's not too bad. Uh, but, but, um, but it really takes a long time. And that's my printer printing something else. Okay, so uh, wiring. Uh, start small, try a chip. Build some abstraction around it, play around with it, uh, make sure it works. Be very mindful of logic levels and power levels. Um, don't source a lot of current from the GPI ports. Uh, there, there are a lot of things to, 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 to take, um, be, be mindful of. But it all re pretty much boils down to just read the chip specifications. And you build yourself a nice little uh, library of sensible abstractions. And then when you want to build the real thing, the robot, you can start going top down again and, and just slot in the things that you already know work. Also, when I killed my Raspberry Pi, um, I killed the SD card at the same time. And it takes a while to just install you know, the operating system and all the tools and everything you want. So once you're done with setting everything up, make an image, do backup, own more SD cards than one, and, and you know, the standard thing, use a SCM. And the Raspberry is much more powerful than you'd think. I mean, you can just VNC into that machine and, and uh, you can even run, run a development environment in, on it if you feel like just experimenting a little bit. So the flight recorder on the Raspberry Pi. There is an API in JDK 7 and 8 um, that allows you to record custom events into the flight recorder. Um, does everybody know what the flight recorder is? Not everybody? Okay, so there, there is this uh, technology in the runtime that allows you to, with very little overhead, record what is going on in the runtime and, and in the application running on the runtime. It's called Java Flight Recorder. So that's what I was using for recording sensor information and actuator information um, in the runtime. I didn't want to introduce a lot of overhead so, you know, the fact that the flight recorder is, has its own little, uh, you know, native, native local, th uh, thread local uh, buffers and, and uh, uh, nice time stamping, et cetera, uh, was, was a good thing. So I decided to use that to record what is going on in the robot and then dump the flight recording to, to my little tool and then I could visualize and see what, what had happened. I even put some MBNs in so that I could control it from, from, from you know, <laughs> a JMX console. Um, you know, turn on the automatic uh, and just remote control it if I wanted to. So for coffee, I have events for engine changes, um, laser scans, both the overarching timed laser scan. You know, I'm doing a scan and all the points, individual points of that scan. Oh, okay. So no volume from the computer. Let's see if we have some volume. Hey, I 
don't even see my. Okay. Quickly checking. Yeah, the volume seems to be on. You want to? <laughs> okay. Do you get volume? Okay, so let's just, just skip that thing. Yeah, I think it's a bit late for, for getting that volume to work anyway, so let's just continue. Okay, so I did put um, put events for also for, for, for the gold target and whatever, you know, other information I thought would be useful. And this is what it looks like code-wise using the unsupported API. The new API in JDK 9 is much cleaner, but this is what you would do. You would, if you want to be able to, to know the duration of the event, you would extend a timed event. And I have a relational key so that I can group everything that, you know, all the individual sample points with a certain scan. And, um, and this version of the API, it's really important to make sure that you either had to have a public getter or, or that the field that you're trying to record is public. Not so in JDK 9. Also, you have uh, the actual point. So, you know, relative to, to the robot itself. And that's just X, Y, and again, the scan ID so that I can find everything else that is related. Generating events is very easy. You just, uh, I just do set point and the scan ID and then commit the event. In this particular case, I can reuse the event object because I know that they are all going to be emitted in the same thread for this version of coffee, <laughs> not in the next. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, I just reset the event between every emission. Don't need to allocate. That is not necessary in JDK 9. Um, right. And you can go to my blog if you want to know more about how to start flight, flight recordings and control the flight recorder. I also did, so there's this tool called J Java Mission Control in the, in the JDK, and um, I did integrate with that so that I was able, I'm able to, to visualize the, <laughs> the scans. And uh, if you're interested in how to do that, uh, even though it's totally unsupported, you can go to uh, GitHub and check out Robo4j because I submitted something similar there too. So some demos. So this is uh, Coffee at Java 1. Um, and he's running in, in fully autonomous mode. And I think I limited his max speed to 0 0.3 of 1 or something like that. So he's not going, going full speed here. And yeah, he's using his laser rangefinder to find his way. And he's dynamically changing his speed depending on how things look ahead. And, and he's going to go, this is not a very good place to be, so I probably want to go somewhere else. Right. And here he goes off. Continue to look around. Right, so I had one more demo, but um, <laughs> the little, try to find if I can get this up again. Okay, so let's get this back. Okay, so here is a flight recording of, of, of uh, so basically this is what I did. I did a very simple just uh, wall avoidance algorithm first, and then I started recording the laser scans from a trial run in my apartment. 
then I started developing from the pre-recorded sensor data, I started to develop the algorithms for, for um, segmenting everything. So find things that are related to each other. And then I did feature extraction. So where are the corners? The cross is a corner. Um, you know, the solid lines are walls. And um, then I did some other funky <laughs> algorithms for, for, for you know, finding good places to go. But uh, the, the point here is that after I had done that first recording, I did most of the development work without even running the robot anymore. I had recorded sensor data that is from real life, so I could try my algorithms, see does this actually detect the walls, blah, 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 all inside of my plugin. And then when I was done developing the algorithms, I could just, you know, copy it to, <laughs> to copy, and it actually worked, so, you know, yay. Okay, <clears throat> so there is this, um, started to port things from Coffee <laughs> to something called Robo4j, uh, which is a framework for quickly building robots uh, in Java. The core framework is pure Java, and uh, we have hardware-specific support for, for uh, Raspberry Pi and Lego currently, so if you're into Lego robots, you can try this out as well. And uh, we just got started, so you know the core framework, as it looks right now, was pushed uh, in you know January, February, some sometime. So this is all up for you know. <laughs> if you don't like something, just tell us. Uh, we're currently just building things that we need. So you know, if you need something different, tell us. So this is a very an overview of this, <laughs> what it looks right now. We have a module that most things uh, depend on, which is Robo4j Math. And then we have um, hardware-specific modules, like um, Hardware Pi. And the thing with those two modules is that um, you don't even need to use Robo4j at all to use the hardware abstractions. So if you just want to you know, talk to the GPS, but you don't fancy building an abstraction for it yourself, you can just take the Robo4j Hardware Pi uh, GPS and, and use it. You don't need to have anything else. Um, same with the LCD or whatever you're, you're, you're using. Uh, but hopefully you're going to want to use the other parts as well. That um, gives you a, uh, another programming model where you can actually configure your robot in XML. Uh, I mean, you can use Java to configure it as well, but um, this, is, um, this is what it would look like if you did configure it in XML. So you get yourself a robot builder, you add the XML, uh, to the robo builder, you can also add instances or classes and uh, you know whatever. And then you do builder build. You get a context. You do context start, and then your robot is up and running. Uh, in this case, after that, we actually send uh, get a reference to the LCD component we have configured in XML and send a little message that we want the LCD to, to display. And then we're waiting for quit and do uh, an orderly uh, shutdown of the context, uh, context when we get to key press. And this is the XML. So there are two, um, two components that are just off the shelf and configured, the, no code from, from us there. And one of them is an LCD unit, uh, and one of them is a button unit. And those are actually part of the same hardware. You can see that the hardware address is the same, but they are logically separated. Uh, so. Uh, you know, this is the LCD with the little buttons. And that's, uh, you could maybe see the backlight demo when, you know, we're changing the color of the backlight. So, uh, you know, we do separate the button unit from logically from, from the LCD. And then we have our own code, which is setting up the demos and doing the menus, and, and that is the, the, the LCD example controller. And the controller just accepts these messages, does a little bit of initialization, processes the messages up and down. We just switch between different demos, and uh, pressing select will run a demo. So very straightforward. OK. So the results then, uh, you know, this was quite fun for me. <laughs> it was scary for my kids, so it didn't really, 
that the intended reason didn't really work, but 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 um, you know it's really really fun to build these things. Um, the kids at that age seems to really li like being in control, so building radio-controlled versions were very appreciated. And uh, so for the future, I would like to do a full implementation of something that uh, in probabilistic robotics is called simultaneous, simultaneous location and mapping. So uh, that is something that I would like to, to have implemented. Um, but before that, I am now working on my autonomous robotic glider. So basically, a plane that will go look for thermals and make sure to utilize the thermals optimally and keep mapping and remapping where, where the thermals are. Um, of course, <laughs> since I got um, twins, <laughs> and yeah, well, <laughs> it's time consuming, I'd say. So, you know, my schedule for all these projects have sort of been pushed out a bit. Um, it's fun. So, some additional resources. That is my blog, where I blog about uh, all, you know, usually things in the Java runtime. So, serviceability features, uh, often unsupported stuff, uh, but uh, that are still useful to know about. Things that might become supported one day, you never know. And on Thingiverse, I have my designs. So if you want to print out a, a coffee, you can just go to Thingiverse and, and download the STLs and print them. Uh, mission Control is on oracle.com slash mission control. And Robo4j is, uh, you know, robo4j.io. And uh, I think that's it. We have 10 minutes or so for, for questions. Any questions? Sorry, the question. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the question was if I'm using the data from the runs for integration testing, and we're not there yet. <laughs> I mean, so so I, I was mostly developing uh, the algorithms for, for, for feature extraction, etc., uh, inside of Eclipse running in the plugin, running the plugin in Eclipse, right, and debugging and running it uh, as I was doing changes. So this was just a very quick way for me to verify that, you know, that my thinking was, was holding up on real data. Um, but that saved me quite a bit of time. Uh, uh, you know, first I tried. <laughs> and this is a real-time system, right? So you can't really have a breakpoint. <laughs> the robot will continue running forward, <laughs> right? Oh, I'm at that breakpoint. What is actually happening here? Uh, nah, doesn't really work. So, so this was a very, very good way to, to get f try out the algorithms. Right, so the question was, uh, Raspberry Pi have cameras. Uh, what, did I th consider using it for, 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 for more than just streaming, I guess? <laughs> and uh, yes, absolutely. So um, there is uh, one guy that is loosely uh, uh, related to Robo4j that is an expert in, in uh, image processing. So, and Kofi has uh, a camera. So on his head there, um, so this is, the 3D printed thing, his head, and you know you have the laser rangefinder here. The camera goes here, so there is a camera already. But I'm just using it for streaming images uh, back, so I'm not processing them and I'm not using them for mapping out the environment at all today. But in the future, who knows? Okay, any other questions? Okay, so. Um, I do have some, uh, some uh, printouts from things that I'm doing for my next project. So if you're interested, you can just come up and I can explain the stuff that I'm, that I'm doing. Or if you have other questions, you know, just, just come up and ask. Great, thanks.